Well, good morning, Elk Lake. Uh, it's wonderful to see you here. Welcome, to, and we're so glad that you've chosen to worship together with us as we worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, a special welcome to those joining us uh, on the internet this morning. Um, you'll recall last week we started a series of CBWC um, uh, videos, just very short videos, and we'll be showing them for, for the next several weeks. We're going to start this morning with part two of that series. So let's roll it. Hello, I'm Bob Weber. This is the Generosity Project, a ministry of the CBWC Foundation. In this video, we'll discuss how we should give as believers. And that is prayerfully, wisely, freely, and voluntarily. Firstly, we need to be prayerful in our approach to giving. Channeling God's resources into his kingdom is part of the spiritual work of all believers and should be guided through the Holy Spirit in prayer. Next is wisely. There are literally thousands of ministries that are seeking our donations. To navigate with wisdom means to have a plan, best yet a written plan each year for our giving. We can always leave room for spontaneity in giving, but as part of a plan. Wisdom in giving is having our priorities in, gi in giving in place to guide us. And finally, wisdom means we must be discerning and take care that the ministries we support handle money in a godly and transparent fashion. That is part of your role as steward of the resources God has given you to manage on his behalf. Freely. Once we determine in our hearts to give, we must release the funds from our control. When we're placing our tithe on the offering plate, we symbolically drop it out of our hands. We don't continue to hold it as the plate is passed. So too, we let go of the control of the gifts we give and let others finish the process of using those funds for the kingdom. We should not use giving as a means of control or of manipulation. Voluntarily. Though the Bible commands us to give and implores us in strong terms, giving in biblical terms is always voluntary. It has to be our free decision to give. It shouldn't need to be said, but if you're being compelled or manipulated into giving, you should consider a change. Manipulation can be subtle, as in expertly crafted but over the line mail appeals. Or some churches who demand to see our annual T4 to measure your giving. As a note, keep an eye on the seniors in your life. Their loyalty to given can sometimes be abused by ministries who may excessively keep increasing the frequency and urgency of appeals and cause our seniors stress and even excessive giving for their financial situation. The biblical image for us is that of a steward. The steward was a professional manager who managed an estate on behalf of the owner. We are called to be God's steward of the resources God has placed in our hands. They're his resources, though they meet our needs and the needs of others through giving. They deserve to be managed thoughtfully and prayerfully. How we give matters. Great, good thoughts to remember as we think about our giving. I have a few other things to share. Um, first, as you may have noticed, uh, we're still wearing our name tags and we'll continue to do that for the month of uh, October. 
Uh, I find them very handy when I forget who I am. I can just take a look down and, oh, oh yeah. Uh, but please remember to return your name tag to the table at the back of the church uh, before you leave. And if you don't have one of these uh, beautiful plastic name tags. Just leave your handwritten one on the table and we'll, uh, we'll have, a, have a plastic one for you next week. Uh, a special announcement, uh, tomorrow evening at 7, we'll be holding a special prayer time for Maureen McPhee's daughter, Courtney, here at the church. Many of you have been following her journey through her diagnosis of a, a very rare brain problem, and we're now at the step where Courtney is going to Spain for surgery for that. So please come together tomorrow at 7 to raise Courtney up to God for protection as she travels and through her surgery, and to pray that this surgery may give her a renewed and healthy life. You may also be aware that our dear sister Janet Goodwin has relocated from her longtime residence in Saanich to the Shoal Center in, Kid in Sydney. And Janet has written a letter of gratitude to the congregation, and she asked that we read it. So, so here's her letter. Hello, ELB family. Just a note to let you know that I'm now in my new home in Sydney and can hardly believe it, just in time for Thanksgiving. This was last week. So I'm blessed, I'm so blessed to have family like you that I can't say thank you enough for all of your prayers. I almost certainly needed them as I was so stressed, and out, stressed out at the time and perhaps even a little testy. But you were so patient with me. A very special thank you to two couples and one friend from my old place. They know who they are who were like angels that God sent to me for helping with packing, unpacking, organizing, etc. I don't know what I would have done without you. I can never thank you enough. The staff here are tremendous and all of them are very nice and so willing to help. The meals are so delicious, I'm gonna be a fat lady soon. <laughs> I will, I'm still trying to adjust, but I know that that will take time and with God's help, I'll make it. I wish to wish everyone at ELB a very special and happy Thanksgiving and may God's blessings be upon each of you. Love always from Janet. Um, we have one additional announcement. Don is going to come and talk to us about the Christmas shoe boxes. Hi, everyone. It's my favorite time of year, um, not because uh, of the weather, it's because of Operation Christmas Child. And what I like about Operation Christmas Child is it reminds me of Christmas and that our dear Lord and Savior was born. And with these Operation Christmas Child boxes, most of the children who receive them will also learn about our dear Jesus Christ. So I just wanted to, just a couple of things. Um, so first, you, if you would like to have a shoe box, like the video said, this is volunteer. <laughs> you don't have to do it. I'm not gonna twist your arm. Um, there is some giving associated with it, not only the gifts that you put inside the box, but with each box they ask that you put a $10 donation to help with um, the shipping of them. And also, um, this year they're trying to get um, more of the, um, the journey um, um, little booklets that they make for each of the children so that they uh, will go for a 12-week um, session on learning about Jesus. And so they ask if you would like to, to put an extra $6 just to tick the box with the little form that we have inside the box here. Um, and, and just put on it for the, the, the learning class. One more thing, very, very important. Most of these shoe boxes are going to countries that are not like us. They have garbage everywhere. So what we ask is that you take the packaging off your item. If you got a little toy car that's in a big package, take it out of the package and just put the car in because we have recycling here and they don't. And that's all I'm gonna say. And if you um, are interested in um, taking a shoebox, I'll be at the back uh, after the service today. Thank you very much. We're gonna see a little video now. Great, thank you, Donna. Um, and there are a few other announcements that in your bulletin, I'll let you uh, 
peruse that at your, at your leisure. Our, um, our opening scripture this morning is Psalm 103, verses 1 to 5. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so joyful to be here in the midst of your people. We are joyful to meet with you this morning and we give you praise from our inmost beings. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for your redemption. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you shower upon us. We look forward to meeting with you this morning, Lord. We invite you into our presence and, and we ask that your spirit touch us and change us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand and our opening hymn is hymn number eight, Come Thou Almighty King. For our prayer of confession this morning, uh, I would like us to pray together the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray, often called the Lord's Prayer. If you know it, feel free to say it out loud with me. If not, just feel free to pray it in your heart as you hear the words. So would you please bow with me as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We remember that Jesus, uh, after teaching this prayer to his disciples, spoke these words, saying, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. 
But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters in Christ, as you have confessed to the Lord your own forgiveness of others, may you rest assured in the knowledge that your Father in heaven has forgiven you. Amen. I'd like to invite the worship team to come forward. All right, at this time, uh, the kids can head out to their adventure time. Yes! <laughs> and now our time for the prayers of our community. So this is our opportunity to bring before our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ any thanksgivings we may have to give to him, any requests for his help or intercession in our lives, and any words of encouragement that he might have placed on your heart this week to share with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And so you can do that just by raising your hands from where you are. Um, we for sure want to... All right, let's pray. Would you please bow with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that as your children, uh, you take delight in us and as your creatures, uh, you take delight in us as well and you know us. And so Heavenly Father, the fact that you know us so well and that you delight in us casts out our fear so that we can come to you and lay all our requests before you. And so, Heavenly Father, we want to lay all our requests before you. And Lord, we also want to give you thanks. We give you thanks for baby Joy, who's sharing her joy with us right now. We give you thanks um, for all the children uh, that will be touched by Operation Christmas Child. We pray that as they said, it really would be an opening uh, in their hearts and in the hearts of their families to hear the good news of your son, Jesus. And Father, we also want to give you thanks, um, as Jason said, for your Holy Spirit and for the opportunity to discover the gifts that you have given us and to use them in service of each other so that we might experience your loving touch not only in our hearts, but through the hands of other believers. And so, Father, we ask that you would make us hands and feet to love and serve each other by the power of your Spirit. This we pray in Jesus' name and for the further fame of his name. Amen. All right. I'd like to invite Maureen to come and read for us. Good morning. Uh, today's uh, chapter is uh, Genesis chapter 4. We'll carry on with Genesis. And Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look on it with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It deserves to have you but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? 
Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, no, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad was the father of Mahujel, and Mahujel was the father of Methushel, and Methushel was the father of Lamech. Lamech married two women, one married Ada and the other Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who play stringed instruments and pipes. Zila also had a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was Nema. Lemoch said to his wives, Ada and Zila, listen to me. Wives of Lemoch, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lemoch 77 times. Adam made love to his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel, since Cain killed him. Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. And this is the word of the Lord. Would you please bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, it is our prayer that you would lead us into life. We recognize that we do not have the power to keep ourselves alive, but that our lives depend wholly upon you. And so at this time, we ask that you would open our minds to understand the word of life that you have spoken to us through the scriptures. And that in understanding it, we may put our faith in you and enter deeper into the eternal life that has been given to us through your son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name and for the further fame of his name. Amen. I think oftentimes <clears throat> we tend to think that we're in control of our own lives. When we think about ourselves, I think it's pretty easy for us to assume that the choices that I make are what determine my steps. My choices are what shape my future. But from the very beginning, the Bible teaches us that this is not true. Human choice is still very important. When Adam and Eve chose to eat the fruit in the Garden of Eden in disobedience to God, that choice was significant. It brought about serious consequences and significant change on the world. But it never brought control. You see, our choices are very important in terms of responsibility and consequence. For example, the choice whether or not we will surrender to Jesus as Lord is a choice between life and death. But human choice has never had the power to determine future. A choice you or I make today does not have the power to determine what our future will look like even 10 years from now. From the very beginning, it has never has and it never will. Now, living in quiet Victoria, British Columbia, can and I think does deceive many of us into thinking that we do have a rather large amount of control over our lives. That what I choose today will determine things tomorrow. But unlike many of us here, there are others who know this is not true. For example, there are those who live currently or have lived in a war zone. They know that they are not in control of their lives. They know that there are powers and forces greater than them 
that are in play that determine what they can and can't do with their future. They experience those powers wipe out their future plans in a moment. Few things can wake us up to the fact that we are not in control of our lives as getting caught up in a war can. And those who have been caught up in the wars in Ukraine and now in Israel and in other places of the world, they know this. But my brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to know it too. Why? Because no matter how physically peaceful it may be in our corner of the world, we are all caught up in a universal spiritual war, whether we realize it or not. We are caught up in a war that has been raging since the beginning. You see, when God cursed the serpent Satan, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where you may remember from last week it said, God said to the serpent, and I will put enmity, that is hatred, between you and the woman, and between your offspring or seed and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. My brothers and sisters in Christ, that was a declaration of war. God will crush the serpent's head through one of Eve's descendants, her seed. He will bring about a great victory for us over Satan. This is war. But the serpent, in retaliation, is going to strike back. He will strike the heel of the seed of the woman and bruise her seed, we're told. Now, this war language refers most importantly to the decisive battle that Jesus won over Satan through his death on the cross. It's already a, fut- a prediction of this future event in their future, our past. And, but as costly as it was then for Jesus to lay down his life for us, his death on the cross was not a tragedy. It was a triumph. Through his death, Jesus crushed the head of the serpent. He turned the tide of the spiritual war that began way back in Genesis 3. And because Jesus died, the Bible tells us that Satan's time is now short, while those who belong to Jesus have been given eternal life. Jesus' battle with Satan was the ultimate battle and won the ultimate victory in the war. But my brothers and sisters, Jesus' battle was not the only battle in this war. Remember, in verse 15 at the beginning, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. God graciously put enmity, hatred towards Satan, the one who had deceived Eve, into Eve's heart. And by so doing, he brought Eve over onto God's side in the war. We see this clearly when we turn to Genesis chapter 4 in the words that Eve speaks. You see, it's Eve, not Adam, who speaks here, and her words demonstrate her committed allegiance to the Lord. In verse, chapter 4, verse 1, we read her saying, With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. And then in the close to the story, in verse 25, Eve says, God has granted me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. So Eve, though originally deceived, has repented and has given her full allegiance back to the Lord her God. Even though Eve was the first to disobey God, she is recorded also as the first to give her allegiance back to God. The one who was first to sin is now the one by God's grace who is first to repent. Eve was caught up in the war between God and Satan, but she has gone back to God's side. Not only this, she has been promised that she will have descendants, seed, that will also be on God's side in this war. However, Genesis 3.15 doesn't just talk only about Eve and her seed. It also talks about the offspring or seed of the serpent. In other words, Satan has descendants too. And Satan's descendants, or seed, also have enmity. But theirs is toward the seed of the woman, the descendants of Eve. Satan's descendants will fight against Eve and her descendants. But who are these descendants of Satan? Who is the seed of the serpent? Well, that is what Genesis chapter 4 is about. Genesis chapter 4 reveals the origin and identity of the seed of the serpent. It tells the story of the beginning of Satan's offspring. In other words, we could say that Genesis 4 begins the tale of two seeds. It clearly identifies the seed of Eve, the descendants through whom Jesus the Messiah will eventually come, but in so doing, it also identifies the seed of the serpent, 
Those who, like Satan, will oppose God and his righteous people. We see this made clear at the end of the chapter. In chapter 4, verse 25, we read these words. Adam made love to his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. Now, Eve's words, God has granted me another child, are literally, God has granted me another seed in place of Abel. And in Hebrew, this is also an odd way to refer to your kids. <laughs> it's an unusual way to refer to a child, and it is meant by the author to draw our attention back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and God's promise of a seed of the woman that will eventually lead to the crushing of Satan's head by Jesus Christ. In other words, the point here is not that Seth was some, merely some emotional replacement, some emotional comfort to Eve in the loss of Abel. The point is that Abel had been God's promised seed. He was the seed of the woman. He was the beginning of the line of descendants through whom God would accomplish his plan of salvation. But Cain killed Abel. Cain killed the promised seed of God. And the point here is that the death did not stop God. That God still stayed faithful to his promise that he was going to fulfill. And God renewed that promise through the gift of another seed, the gift of Seth. That is what Eve is celebrating here. This is why the ch chapter ends with words about worship. It says, at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. You see, what made Abel and Seth and Seth's sons Enosh the seed of Eve was not simply the fact that they were Eve's biological children, but that they were her spiritual children. Like her, they worshipped. They called on the name of the Lord. And that is what marked them off as the seed of Eve, the children of God's promise. And next week, we will see how that faithful worship was passed from one generation to the next, all the way to righteous Noah. In fact, one of the threads that runs through the whole Bible is the tracing of this seed of Eve, all the way through Abraham and Israel to Jesus, and then on to all those who believe in Jesus today, including you and me. When Paul refers <clears throat> back to this promise, he, Paul refers back to this promise when he refers to Christians as Abraham's seed in Galatians 3.29. In other words, if you have put your faith in Jesus, you are the seed of the woman Eve. You are on God's side in the great spiritual war that has been raging from the very beginning. But this week, in looking at Genesis 4, the emphasis is not on the good seed, but on the bad seed, on Cain and his descendants. Now, Cain was not born bad. Cain did not start out as the offspring or seed of Satan. He became the first seed of the serpent. And Genesis 4 is the story of how that happened and its significance for us today. And Cain's story begins with worship. You see, it is worship that is the headwaters that separates two paths to two different kinds of seed. Cain and Abel both worshipped. They both brought offerings to the Lord. That's where the story starts. And it was a deficiency in Cain's worship of the Lord that first sets him on the path towards becoming Satan's offspring instead of Eve's. And we are told this directly by the inspired author of the story, starting uh, near the end of verse 4, where we read, that the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. Abel and his offering found favor with God, but Cain and his offering did not find favor with God. There was something deficient. And note that it doesn't just speak about the offering. It's not only the offering that Cain brings that's deficient. It says both his offering and Cain himself were not, did not find favor with the Lord. In other words, there was something not right inside of Cain. There was something wrong in his heart towards God, and that heart deficiency was expressed physically through what Cain brought as an offering. 
therefore, if we can see what was wrong with what Cain brought as an offering, it will point us back to the deeper problem of what was wrong in Cain's heart. So then, what was wrong with Cain's offering? Well, it wasn't anything to do with the fact that it was from the soil instead of the flock. God doesn't have, you know, sheep aren't his favorite compared to grain. That's not the issue. The author makes this clear in a way that's harder for us to see, but the word for offering here uh, is an unusual word uh, in that it's the one that's only used for grain offerings everywhere else in the Old Testament. It's, this is the one and only place where it's used to also refer to an offering from an animal. And this, I think Balky's right, he says is an indication that the author is trying to make it clear that it has not, nothing to do with the fact that he's bringing a grain offering. Uh, that's not what's wrong with what Cain brings. The issue, rather, had to do with the quality of Cain's offering. See, we're told in verse 3 that Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as his offering. Now, at first, this doesn't sound like a problem, at least not until the inspired author contrasts it with what Abel brought as his offering. In verse 4, we read that Abel didn't just bring some of his sheep, he brought the best of the best. We read that it says that Abel brought the fat portions of the firstborn of his flock. Now, to us, fat doesn't sound like the best, does it? <laughs> but that's, that was different. Back in ancient times, the fat parts of the animal were the best parts. Today, we might want to parallel it to like, it's like the ribeye or the filet mignon, right? Like, they were the choice cuts of meat. And so Abel brings that. He brings God his very best. But he doesn't just bring the best, he brings the first of the best. And the significance of this is also, I think, often lost on us today. You see, in the ancient world, when you brought a gift to a superior like your king, you didn't just bring some of what you had. That was a bad idea. You brought the best, but you didn't just bring the best. You also brought the first. Because if you raised animals, in other words, you brought the firstborn. And if you grew crops, you brought the first fruits, which is precisely what Cain didn't do. If you've read through the Old Testament, you'll hear in the sacrifices, it's always the first fruits that you're to bring. Now, bringing the first was a declaration that everything else, I brought you first as a sign that everything else that I have is also yours. The first is this declaration that all that I have is yours, even though I'm only bringing you this part. And this appears to be the difference between Cain and Abel. Abel's gift communicated that, that he himself and everything he had belonged to the Lord. That was the message it sent. Cain's offering communicated that only some of Cain's stuff, and therefore only some of his heart, belonged to the Lord. Or to put it more simply, Cain's worship was wholehearted, Cain's worship was half-hearted. It was this difference in worship that sent them down two very different paths. Now, it's important to note, I think, that half-hearted worship was not what ultimately made Cain into Satan's offspring. It didn't just happen like that. God's judgment on Cain comes only after he acted on what was going on in his heart, only after he murders his brother. But what Cain's half-hearted worship does, or did to him, was put him in great danger. And this danger began with Cain's emotions. Right? When Cain learned that God would not accept his half-hearted worship, that that wasn't good enough, Cain became angry. Right? In fact, we're told in verse 5 that he became very angry. But God didn't judge Cain for his emotions. Instead, God speaks to Cain to warn him of the danger that he's in, of what's going on inside him. In verse 6, God speaks to Cain and actually offers him grace, saying, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? I'm still <laughs> totally happy to accept you. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. This is the danger that half-hearted worship puts us in. Half-hearted worship creates resentment and eventually deep-seated anger towards God in our hearts. 
We may offer God our Sunday mornings. We may offer God some of our money. We may offer God some of our time during the week to pray and read the Bible, all in the hopes that he will bless us. But we reserve some money, time, and even relationships to do with as we will as opposed to what he would. We keep back some of the first and some of the best for ourselves. And when God expresses to us the fact that he is not going to accept that kind of offering, he will only accept it if we give him something that signifies that all of it belongs to him. We get angry with him. We resent him, just like Cain did. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the moment of danger. That is the point when sin, like a hungry lion, is crouching at your door and is ready to pounce on you. That is the moment when what we do next will determine who has control over our lives. This is the point of this story. That if we do not give God 100% control over our lives and all that we have, if we try to hold back anything from God and refuse to let it go, then the good God who created us and loves us ceases to be our Lord and sin becomes our master instead. My brothers and sisters, sin desires to have you. That is, your sinful desires want to take over your life and control you. And the only hope we have for a life that is not controlled by evil, by sin, is a life that is wholly and completely given over to God. In other words, worship is our only hope of escape from being ruled by sin. Either we give God control of everything, or sin takes control of us. You can live under sin's control, or under God's control. Those are your only two choices. And this is the critical choice that faced Cain. Would he accept God's gracious offer to change and do what is right by bringing his first fruits? Would he give over everything and not just some things? Or would he refuse God's offer of grace and let sin take over? Now, tragically, Cain rejects God's grace and he gives in to sin. And it is through this rejection of God's grace that harm enters into the world for the very first time. Cain's unjustified anger at God takes control, and since he can't vent that anger on God, he vents it on someone who belongs to God. He murders his brother Abel. In trying to take control of his own life apart from God, Cain actually hands his life over into the control of his sinful desires and to his anger. And thus Cain becomes the first offspring of the devil. He became the serpent's seed. You see, sin is the chief character of Satan. And now Cain, Cain's Lord, has become that very same character trait. Now, all this transfer of allegiance is not just an issue for Cain, my brothers and sisters. It's an issue for us. When John the Baptist called the religious leaders of his day a viper's brood, he was referring to Genesis 3 and 4, marking them off as the offspring of Satan, the seed of the serpent. And when Jesus tells them in John chapter 8 that the devil is their real father, Jesus is identifying the majority of pastors and committed churchgoers in his day as the offspring of Satan, not of Eve. That should be shocking news to us. As religious as these people were, they had each failed to give themselves wholly to the Lord, and in holding back some parts, they had unwittingly become children of the devil. And this failure to be wholehearted in worship led them down the very same path as Cain. Just like Cain murdered righteous Abel, so they murdered righteous Jesus. Now, lest any of us get arrogant, Paul reminds us that we were all once enemies of God in this way. It was only by receiving God's offer of grace in Christ while we were his enemies that we have been saved and washed clean so that we can worship as we should. We were once slave to, slaves to sin like Cain, but now we are slaves to Christ. Those are the only two options. The question for us is, whose slave are we?
because we're not in control of our lives, my brothers and sisters. Either through wholehearted worship, we give ourselves completely to God, trust in his grace, and are therefore guided into righteousness by his spirit. Or we reject God's offer of grace through Jesus Christ, like Cain did, and we fall under the power and control of sin. It is pursuit of wholehearted worship by the grace of God that separates the seed of the woman Eve from the seed of the serpent Satan. Or to put this another way, when you and I have a worship failure, do we accept God's offer of grace and come back to him and give our lives back to him? Or at the trajectory of our life decisions again and again to reject that grace and do our own thing? That is what separates the seed of Eve from the seed of Satan in the end. And the rest of Genesis 4 is essentially a warning to the righteous seed of Eve of what the seed of the serpent will do to them. And Jesus, you may remember, warns us of the very same thing. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, Jesus says, You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. My brothers and sisters, Genesis 4 explains why. Cain is very angry with God, not with his brother. But he can't take his anger out on God. So who does he take his anger out on? The person who belongs to God, who is worshiping God wholeheartedly, his brother Abel. My brothers and sisters, there are lots of people who are very angry with God. And this is God's heads up that they're going to take that anger out on us, on those who follow God. And God does not want this to surprise us. After all, we're in a spiritual war. And as long as there are people under the control of sin, those who are under the control of Christ will suffer at their hands, just as Christ himself did. And you know what? They're not going to feel guilty about it either. Like Cain, when the Lord confronts him about Abel, their answer will be, Am I my brother's keeper? Think about it. Paul, the Apostle Paul, before he became a Christian, thought he was doing God a favor by arresting and killing Christians. So we shouldn't expect much sympathy either. And if God brings a consequence, a judgment upon them to discipline them, to correct them, many of them, just like Cain, will not repent. Rather, they will complain, like Cain does in verses 13 and 14, that God is actually out to get them. They will deny the truth that this judgment of the Lord was for their correction and will insist what God is really attempting to do is to kill them, to ruin their lives. Please note that there is no change of heart in Cain towards God in this story, despite God's offers of grace on two occasions and, his dis and it, despite his discipline aimed at correcting him. In the end, we read in verse 16 that Cain went out from the Lord's presence. He left and he lived in the land of Nod, which means wandering east of Eden. Now, if this were just a corruption of individual human beings, that would be bad enough. But sadly, it gets worse. And that's the point of verses 17 through 24. These verses show that sin not only controls certain individual human beings, it has also seized control of human culture. In verse 17, we read that Cain, the first murderer, was also the first person to build a city. The first city was a city controlled by sin. Now, this does not mean cities are bad. It just means, as we'll see in a few weeks with the story of the Tower of Babel, that human community's default setting is organized rebellion against God. That's where we start. And this is another thread that runs through the whole Bible. God's work of drawing us out of the rebellious city of Babylon, as the Bible uses it metaphorically, and into the good city of the new Jerusalem is one of the major themes that runs through Scripture. And the point here in Genesis 4 is to let us know that human culture got started on the wrong foot, my folks. It's not that culture is bad, but it just got off to a bad beginning. It was infected by sin right from the start, and this sin affects all aspects of our public life. This is the point of the story about Lamech. Lamech is the seventh generation from Cain. He and his children expressed the full or complete fruit of what Cain started when he built that city. Sin has impacted agriculture and food distribution through Lamech's son, Jabal. Sin has impacted music and the arts through Lamech's son, Jubal. 
His sin has impacted ironworking and industry through Lamech's son, Tubal Cain. All of these areas of human culture have suffered the corruption of justice that is celebrated by their father, Lamech. When we read in verse 24 as he speaks to his wives, if Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. Here he is celebrating corruption of God's justice. God had put a sign on Cain to deter other people from killing, to help curb violence. And the message of that sign on Cain was that anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Seven being the number that symbolizes perfection or completion. In other words, God is foreshadowing the law of the lex talionis that will come later in the Pentateuch. The law that says eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life. And Lamech perverts this justice by killing in response to simply being wounded. It's like bruise for death. And what God, therefore, intended to deter killing, to deter murder, Lamech twists and used to multiply murder. What's interesting is Jesus uses the same phrase, but with forgiveness. Jesus quotes in back to his uh, disciples when they ask him, how many times should I forgive? Seven times completely? And Jesus says, no, 77 times. It's the undoing of what Lamech is doing here. Because Lamech perverted God's original intention. He did it in several ways. In fact, for marriage, by being the first person to marry two women instead of one. And then again in law, by perverting the law and making it something that multiplies murder rather than um, deters it. And therefore, thus it is that the scriptures identify the three enemies of the people of God. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, corrupt culture. The flesh, your corrupt desires inside you, and the devil, the deceiver, who all work together to try and keep us from accepting the grace of God and giving our whole lives over to him in worship. Because, my brothers and sisters, we're not in control of our lives. Either we've given ourselves over wholeheartedly to God in worship and he directs our steps, or we've held things back and sin directs our steps. And so this is the question for us. Is there something we're holding back from God? Are we spending money on something that we know he would not approve of? Are we maintaining or pursuing a relationship that we know would violate our faithfulness to him or to someone else? Are we holding something back from God? And my brothers and sisters, may we accept God's offer of grace and give it all back to him. That is our act of worship. Because sin is crouching at our door and it desires to control us. But we must rule over it. And the only way to do that is through wholehearted worship of God. So my brothers and sisters, I'm going to pray. And then I'm going to invite you to worship. And I invite you to give your hearts to God. Would you bow with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to confess that we are not the masters of our own lives that we could not possibly be because there are forces much greater than us in the world. And so, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us to worship you wholeheartedly, that we might give you full control of our lives so that you can lead us into good paths. And Father, we pray that you would protect us from all the ways that the devil, the world, and our own flesh tries to lead us astray. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to close this morning by singing hymn number 11. This is hymn number 11, Come Thou Fount of Ever. Would you please stand with me as we sing?
Some of you may be angry with God. I don't know. Some of you may have a lot of resentment. or know people who do. And you know what? God can handle your anger. He was not upset with Cain when he was angry with him. In fact, we have a whole pile of psalms that let you vent your anger towards God. But God's reminder in all of that is that sin is crouching at the door and that you must master it and not let it take over you. And the only way we can do that, brothers and sisters, is by giving our whole lives back over to God. That is what worship is. That's what this is about. And that's what you're called to go to out in your weeks, throughout your days. So may you go now in the knowledge and peace and love of your Savior, Jesus Christ, and give your whole lives to him. Amen.